I happen to be a huge um, follower of colonial literature. Um, I love Pride and Prejudice and Sense and Sensibility. And I put myself in that world when I'm reading it, as you all do. And yet, as I read it or as I watch it, I wonder what my people were doing. I walk through my territory and say, as much as Mr. Darcy is there, there was a Mr. Darcy in my community, in my village. There was a Jane Eyre in my village, and no one ever even stopped to think about it. We focus so much on Canadian history, the way it's been taught to us in school, missing all the links, missing all of the history that we are so much a part of in the thousands and thousands of years we've lived here. And it's always on my mind. And then I always have to balance my worlds when I come out to visit Vancouver or any other place that I go. And when I come home, then I'm home again. And all the worries of the world go away because I feel safe amongst my people. However, this goes on maybe in many cultures around the world who've had to witness and be a part of the cruel things that we can do as humans, the cruel things that we do to each other, and then come back to wanting to understand how can we as a people, a culture, and a history, and world learn to love one another and get along. And that's the journey that we're on together. And it's shows like this one that hopefully give you an opportunity to look beyond what you see today and instead of looking into the future, look into the past. That's our teachings is that we always, always remember who we are. We are accountable for the history of our grandparents and great grandparents. We don't say forget about it. We don't say what do you want in this world? We know who we are, even though what has happened to us has happened. We're holding on, we're redefining, but we're never forgetting who we are. We're never letting go of the teachings of our grandparents in being accountable to another village or city for who we are. And if the government of Canada did that, if the colonial world did that, then we would have a better understanding. And that's what I love to give my children when I talk to them in schools, is to go home and talk to your grandparents and your great-grandparents and find your history. And then think about what it means to us today in this world we live in. And I think that Ken did an amazing job of that. I'm in awe of this and I will definitely come back and take my time to walk through and read it. And I want to hold my hands up to him as high as I can, maybe to the universe and to the worlds in which we don't see, and bring that information back to all of us that allows us to understand different worlds and to honor them instead of take them down, to hold our hands up to each culture, to find a way in which we today in this modern world can't get along. A tiny, tiny little virus has brought us to our knees. A war can't fix it. A gun can't fix it. Money can't hardly even fix it. One little tiny virus has brought us all to a place that we don't know which way to turn. And so we can only return to ourselves. We can only go inward to the quiet and hopefully find a way of being at peace with ourselves while we honor the people who will help us as a whole world find a way. And I'd like to just say I hold my hands up to the scientists of the world who are in connection with figuring out how we'll move. But I also believe that there's medicine in our earth and that the very secret may be that it isn't in a vaccine, it might be in a plant. And so we really have to evaluate ourselves, and I'm sure that's why Ken is not here today, because he doesn't want to travel. He wants to be safe, and we all want to be safe, and we inch our way back out. 
And as we do that, please let's all, and I know you all will respect yourselves as you move through the world again in a way we've never been asked to move. So we move quietly, we move respectfully, and as we do that, we always reevaluate ourselves and our connection to each other and somewhat of our disconnection. We have been disconnected for many years in this world. And in our world, in our villages, we feel still connected. And that's what held me as I moved through these last three months that we had to stay home. I felt like it wasn't anything too new to me because we've always stayed home. We've always been asked to stay on our reservation. And we've always connected in those ways that the world out here is going by and we were really going with it. But we are forced in a more modern world to take that step into the future with everyone and maybe hopefully make this beautiful world we're all longing for again. But I'll leave you with my grandfather's words who says, as you move forward, never, never forget to move backwards and balance. Balance between the worlds so that you find a place that works for all of us and that's what we need to do. So I'd like to take this opportunity to again hold my hands up to, to Ken and his vision. It's an amazing vision. And there's a saying that says, without a vision, people perish. So as we're on the verge of perishing, let's reestablish a vision that works for all of us. Thank you. Of our coming to birth. 
He talks about this moment as being a crisis, that the crisis is a call not to arms, but rather to dreams, a call to constitute a vast new countercultural force that can act against a techno patriarchal front. It's a bit wordy, but I think you kind of get the gist, and um, I think it's so, so on the ball. Um, we are the final venue for this exhibition uh, in Canada. We'd originally scheduled it to open in May, um, but of course, due to the coronavirus, um, we've had to delay it four months, and um, it will remain um, at open here until January the 3rd of next year. So we'll, we hope you will revisit and encourage others to, um, uh, to come to the exhibition. Uh, the exhibition, as I said, was produced by the Art Museum at the University of Toronto, and that was in partnership with the Confederation Centre Art Gallery in Charlottetown. And um, it's been made possible in part by uh, the Government of Canada, the Canada Council for the Arts, and the Ontario Arts Council. Um, finally, um, it remains uh, to me to thank uh, the Don Dollar Foley Foundation, who were the lead um, uh, institutional funders. Um, I want to acknowledge Barbara Fisher and their project team for working closely with MOA. Um, and also Barbara and Ken Monkman and the Ken Monkman Studio, um, who really kind of worked to develop a very different way of installing this exhibition. So normally they would have sent their representatives here and we would install it, but they agreed for the first time and it, I think, involved great creativity on the side of our staff and um, also on their staff, um, that they would, super, they would work with us um, remotely through a video link. So um, that's a uh, first for us. And um, I want to thank all of our MOA staff for their flexibility and commitment to this project. Um, most of us are working, still working from home, so um, um, it's been a kind of a, uh, a process of um, coordination with our colleagues, our installers here, um, our designers, um, and our, cur our curator, our nice curator. Um, I think it's gone remarkably well, and I want to thank them for their flexibility, their creativity, and their commitment in kind of installing this exhibition, and uh, what are challenging circumstances. So, thank you everybody. Um, I now want to introduce Dr. Jennifer Kramer, who's our in-house curator uh, for the exhibition, um, who will just say uh, a, few, a few words. Thank you. I think technically my title is Coordinating Curator or Curatorial Liaison. So really all I did was work on communicating between the Kent Monkman Studio and Barbara Fisher and everyone here and talking to the media and the public. So it's been my pleasure to be part of this exhibit. Um, as you probably all know, it is actually a response to the Canada 150 celebrations. This is Kent Monkman's response. So I was super excited to be part of this remarkable show and bringing it to Vancouver where it needs to be. I actually think it's very significant that the bookends of this exhibit, it's been to eight different institutions, but it's bookended by university display spaces. So the Art Gallery at the University of Toronto, and of course the Museum of Anthropology at the University of British Columbia. These are places where students, researchers, and visitors wrestle with knowledge production and multiple ways of knowing. Spaces where difficult and necessary conversations about exactly as Dr. Shelton said, about systemic racism, about Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission's 2015 call to action about Black Lives Matter. These are calls for activism, not just uh, values. And so I think hosting this exhibition here is a really wonderful way to end its nine institution tour across the country. As ever, I have enjoyed working collaboratively with the MOA exhibition team to host the final stop of this exhibition. Exhibit designer Skooker Broom did some phenomenal lighting that you would not see anywhere else on this floor. Graphic designer Cody Rocco 
he reinterpreted the beautiful uh, design of the uh, graphic design. Exhibition fabricator Kate Melker, loans manager Taya Deddy, collections coordinator Shabnam Hanabarkish and Kate Pylon, conservator Moray Tuluf. Together they made this exhibit what it is and allow us to see it. The public facing staff have been calm and nimble, essential characteristics as we open during a pandemic. So heartfelt thank yous to MOA's Curator of Public Programs and Engagement, Marie Wissner, who has had to manage all kinds of virtual, digital, public ideas for how we're going to be engaging with this exhibit, so stay tuned, more is to come. Senior Marketing and Communications Manager, Bonnie Sun, has managed to get the word out to the media. And even shop manager, Sharon Haswell, who has provided wonderful uh, literature and objects that go with this exhibit. And I can't forget to mention Associate Director Moya Waters and Assistant Director Administration and Outreach, Anna Papalardo, who with grace skillfully managed the project and kept communication flowing between MOA, the Kent Monkman Studio, and Barbara Fisher. And I will close, I'm sure you're anxious to see this exhibit, I will close by quoting curator artist Kent Monkman, who dedicated this exhibition, Shame and Prejudice, to his paternal Cree grandmother, Elizabeth Monkman, who was forced to attend Indian residential school in Manitoba and passed away without discussing her residential school experiences. Kent writes that she was, quote, shamed into silence in the face of extreme prejudice. This exhibit is Kent Monkman's hope and resilience, a restoring of justice. So welcome, please enter and enjoy the exhibit. Thank you everybody for joining us and for witnessing this opening. Important, um, important event to continue these, um, these, 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 these traditions. Enjoy the show. Um, our cafe is open and also the um, museum shop is open, which have a number of works by uh, by So please enjoy your visit tomorrow. Thank you for being here.